Hey, this is Karen Coach's Corner Chats, and on the chat, I have Marguerite Alasasa. Marguerite, where are you at, and what are you up to? So, as you know, it's it's the dead period, so I'm on a little vacation. Um, I grew up in the Bay Area, up in Northern California, so um, my husband and I were up here with my family, just kind of hanging out with really nothing on the agenda, which is kind of nice. <laughs> How important is it to have those those moments where you get to just spend it with like your husband and family? Oh, it's the most important thing. I think every single like December to January, a little bit. We also usually get off the Fourth of July week. We really try to just like disconnect, recharge. Um, as you know, like coaching is a twenty four seven job, so it's really important just to be very intentional, like with taking time off, kind of just like resting. We just enjoy the days like we don't have anything to do. They're very few, but they're good Good when they do come along. So this past year at UCLA, when you took over the program, what were some of the first things that you said, hey, I got to get these in place before the season even starts? Well, the first thing, of course, was our staff. Like that was kind of my biggest stressor. Um, one, because I know like the staff dynamic is so important, um, taking on a new program, being a first time head coach, I knew like the people around me were going to be the biggest indicators of whether or not we're successful. So that was my first kind of like thing on the checklist. Um, also just from a personal level, like I knew that the people I was bringing in, I was asking so much of them. I wasn't going to be asking them to move move their families, move themselves kind of into the area. And so I just wanted to make sure that that was right. Um, and then really it was just establishing our culture, kind of establishing our values as a, as a program. Um, things that were really important to us was just establishing how our staff was going to communicate with the team and kind of like what that dynamic was going to be. And then obviously little things in style of play. That was huge. We did defending for like eight months straight uh, so that was quite a challenge but it turned out all right um, and then also just making sure that our team was really enjoying things and um, I think so many people get this idea that in order to be good in order to be successful competitive whatever it may be then you have to kind of sacrifice the fun side and we as a staff wanted to make sure that our team knew like we could do both you mentioned northern California is that where you were born and raised I was born in New Jersey, surprisingly enough, but I was definitely raised in Northern California. Um, both my parents are from California. And so we were out in New Jersey. My dad was working on Wall Street. So I was born there, but as soon as they had the opportunity to move back to the West Coast, we moved. So I think I was like five when we moved back to California. So I, I definitely consider myself like a Bay Area native. Um, yeah. <laughs> At what point did you get the soccer like buzz? Did you start playing like when you got to California? Were you playing in New Jersey? Like when did this whole soccer thing even become part of your life? Um, surprisingly enough, I like by today's standards, I was a late start. Um, I didn't start soccer until I think I was in third grade. So like eight or nine years old. Um, prior to that, I was a baseball player. My dad played baseball in college. So that was like what we did on the weekends. Um, and then all my friends played soccer. So I kind of had to choose like if I was going to hang out with my kind of group of friends, which turned out really well. So I did only one year of AYSO. And then the next year, um, my like peer group had started club soccer. So I kind of joined along with that. So, um, yeah, I wasn't, I think I was eight when I first started playing, which now like, you know, people start playing when they're like two. So that was, I was a little, little behind, I guess you could say, but thankfully I had an incredible club career or like club experience, which I think really made me fall in love with the game. So did that lead into like playing the high school level and then going on to college playing soccer? Yeah. So um, I started club when I was, I think in fourth grade. So like nine, I was actually on like the second team for a season or two. Cause I didn't even have like soccer cleats. I had to go get, like, I only had baseball cleats. Um, did that and then I played club for MBLA did that from I was like nine years old until 18 obviously I played high school soccer just I had a lot of injuries in high school so I don't think I only played one season fully for high school um and then I was fortunate enough to play at Santa Clara in college and 
you know, then one thing led to another and here I am. What was the experience at Santa Clara when you get there? Like when you look back, how impactful was those four years for you? They were hugely impactful. Um, Jerry and I are very close. We had a great relationship. I think the soccer piece, I really developed my understanding from a tactical side and just like this idea of being flexible. Um, when I was playing club, like I was very fortunate. We had five or six national team players on my team. Like we didn't adjust very much, um, which has its benefits and its shortcomings. But when I went to college, like we were playing different systems every year. I was playing in two or three different positions. And so I think that part just made me appreciate the like importance of adaptability. Um, and then Jerry, like he's just been a great mentor to me um, while I was in college and then for the years afterwards. So just building that relationship and having that connection. I've been very fortunate. Like, I think he's, he's had my back. He's been in my corner for, for the last 10 years plus. So very thankful for that. Beyond just the support that Jerry's given you, what are some of the other things as a coach that you take away and go, you know what, when I have my own program, I want to take some of what Jerry has and implement it. Yeah. Jerry, um, he has this like incredible ability to just convince his team that they can win anything. Like you could be so outmatched, but he really just like breaks it down in a way that it feels like you have the answer to, to be successful. So um, I really appreciate that. Um, he's very astute in terms of how so it kind of in the same vein, like how he frames things. So if it is something really difficult, it's a big challenge. If you are going in as the underdog, like just having this confidence that it's like, you know what, on any given day, we can win this game. That's that was something that really spoke to me. And then he also, I, I know I talked about it a little bit, but this um, he's just a tactician and I've really come to appreciate that. One of the things we wanted to have in our program was this idea of flexibility, like this idea of adaptability in that, like whatever the game kind of gives us from a tactical side, we can make adjustments and we can kind of match that or meet that challenge, um, which is very different in some ways than my experience as a club player. And then also my experience as a coach at Stanford, we didn't adjust very much, um, which you know, Stanford does what they do and they do it extremely well. So we didn't often have to adjust very much, but I knew going into this job that that wasn't necessarily going to be the case. And that, um, kind of that versatility was going to work in our favor. And through playoffs, we ended up playing a bunch of different systems and people were playing out of position and stuff. And so I was glad that going into that, we had that kind of in our back pocket. So as you're going through the experience at Santa Clara, at what point does coaching even come into the equation? Is there something, someone said something, or was it something you said, you know what, I think I might like to coach? Oh, no, I can't even like give credit to Jerry there. I don't think I started coaching when I was in high school. So like I was in some ways already kind of a coach. Jerry used to tease me. He would tell me like, when we would talk about career opportunities, he'd be like, let's be real. Like we all know you're going to coach. Like, why are we even talking about something else? Like we know, like it's just in your blood. It's what you're going to do. Um, and so I actually started coaching full time while I was still in college. So my sophomore year, I had two club teams. Um, and it's kind of incredible because I started those teams. They were like six years old and I was 19 ish. And I kept that same group of players until they went to college. So they were 2003 players. So they were in class of 2021. So where they just finished up their sophomore year in college. Wow. What a, and so how cool has that been to see them from like crazy wild little six-year-olds to now grown women making an impact at the college game? And did you actually ever coach against any of them? Yeah. So they play kind of all over the place. Um, you know, there's a handful at Santa Clara. There's um, a handful at Cal, at Stanford. Like it's players we play against. So that that part has been like, one of the most rewarding things I think in my coaching career so far, just to see like these players that I literally knew when they were in first grade, second grade, and kind of went through this whole experience with them. Um, when we won this year, I thought one of the coolest parts was all my former players from the club scene, like just being so excited. And um, cause I laugh with them, like as much as they grew up, like I grew up too, I was 19. Like I was, a, I was a kid, you know? And so they really saw like my development as a coach. 
um, from when I was, you know, still in college playing, trying to balance everything to now. And that part has been really special. So you end your time at Santa Clara. What was the next step for you? So after that, um, well, concurrently, because I had started that those teams, like while I was still in school, I, I continued with them um for I think like two years I was just doing club I had you know at that point they were probably like U10 U11 still on the small field um and then the Stanford job kind of fell into my lap amazingly enough I was you know in the area MBLA and Stanford are very close I had known Paul for a long time even just through the recruiting process and then just being in the bay and um actually Nicole Van Dyke left to go to as a head coach at at the time you pen and then paul kind of reached out in his way and two weeks later i was working at stanford was that a Crazy. hard decision to make or as soon as he reached out where you were like oh wow this is an amazing opportunity i gotta go for it no actually i kept the two club teams so i didn't really have to like choose one or the other which looking back, I don't know how I was doing that, like coaching full-time at Stanford and working with two club teams. That was some, I did that for about three years and that was really tough. Um, but no, I, I, I was so naive. Like, I don't think I even knew at that point, like what, how, how incredible of an opportunity it was. Um, credit to Paul because he has been one of my biggest supporters. And I think I was 24 years old when he hired me at Stanford with zero college coaching experience. Um, and so he really took a chance on me there. And he also allowed me to kind of grow into that role, like how I approached it in my first year or two compared to how I left it seven years later was completely different. Um, and yeah, so I, I will always be indebted to him and just so thankful for like the encouragement he gave me along the way. And also for just the opportunity he gave me, like that just doesn't happen very often. You talked about, Jerry saying, we know you're going to be a coach. Um, then you get Stanford reaching out to you with no experience. Have you always been kind of the, the a leader in like, even as you were coming through high school or on your club teams, or were you always one that kind of united everyone and said, Hey, we got to take care of this or whatever. Was that something that you've always been? Yeah, I think so. I mean, my family would probably laugh at that, probably not in like a good way. Cause I was kind of, I think of like a bossy kid um but yeah I was always like a leader on the team kind of a coach on the field um that I would like physically I'm not gifted like I'm small and slow and fairly weak so I think I had to kind of compensate with my voice like moving players around me like kind of setting things up off the ball so that then I could be successful my team could be successful so I was always kind of a natural leader in that way um but like I said, I think my role, especially at Stanford, my role initially was very much not that. Like I was just absorbing everything around me, observing, just kind of taking everything in. And, you know, by the end, I felt much more of a leader that had a lot more presence. But again, credit to Paul. Like I think he really allowed me to kind of grow in my role at Stanford over those seven years. What was the experience like being, you said, mentioned 24. What's that like being 24 when you're coaching players who are 21, 22, 23, maybe even 24? What was that dynamic like? Yeah, so that was kind of funny because there's players on the Stanford team that I had played against like fairly recently. Um, and so that was, you know, that comes with its challenges. I think the biggest thing is having the confidence to make coaching points to players that are just, two or three years younger than you um, to be quote unquote, like an expert in the game when you don't have that much more experience than they do. Um, but like I said, like Paul was inc extremely encouraging Hideki Nakata, who's now the head coach at Utah. He was the other assistant there at Stanford with me. He was also extremely encouraging. I even had players on the team, like an Andy Sullivan, for instance, who would be like, Mark, like talk more. Like you got, come on, like say more. We want to hear what you say. So it was, you know, it takes a village. Um, I had like, I will say how just a huge part of my success so far has been just the people around me, like giving me encouragement, um, which is kind of funny because I wouldn't label myself necessarily as someone who's shy or hesitant. But I think in just those situations, you know, I, I want to make sure I'm saying the right thing. And I had so many people along the way just being like, like, come on, step up to the plate. You got it. Like, 
say your thing. So yeah, what a funny, I look back on it and I'm like, I was 24. I didn't know what the heck I was doing at all. <laughs> you mentioned your coach at uh, Santa Clara making you believe that you can always win every game. You love the tactics. What was the, you talked about Stanford. We have a way we play and that's kind of what we stick to. What were some of the other takeaways that you had from that experience that again, maybe you've implemented into your own coaching style? Yeah. So one thing at Stanford that I loved is the way Paul teaches the game. I think he does an incredible job of like simplifying it to a point where it's almost black and white in the decision-making but not in a bad way that like stifles creativity. It's just like, okay, wow. It's so cl- He provides so much clarity in like why one decision is better than another. And I really appreciate that. Like he's so calm, like just so thoughtful in the way that he presents information. I hope that I can kind of emulate that. And then the other thing is just like Stanford as a whole, it just breeds professionalism, like in everything that the students do, whether that's in the classroom, off the field, on the field, like everything is about about like striving for excellence, being professional. And so that's something that we also try to bring into our program. Just just like, if we're going to do something, let's make sure we do it the right way. You mentioned being at Stanford for seven years. During that seven years, were there times where you thought, okay, I'm ready to make the jump? Like what were you looking during those seven years or what made you make that jump after seven? No, yeah, I wasn't actively looking for anything. I was like very happy. Um, I mean, I was in the Bay Area, so my whole family was around. Um, my husband, he's from Sacramento, so also from Northern California. We both played at Santa Clara, so we were kind of in the Bay already. Like, it was a perfect situation. Um, and I do think, like, at some point when you're an assistant and you start looking at situations and they're handled one way and in the back of your mind, you're kind of like, oh, all right, I would maybe do it that way. I'd maybe do it a little different. Um, that's when maybe you kind of know like that you're getting towards that point where you can make that jump. But even when I like, I kind of half-heartedly applied to UCLA, not really thinking anything was going to happen from it. Um, so even at that point, like when I got my first call from UCLA, like I was still surprised that I was even being considered. One thing, and we'll get to the UCLA transition, but you've mentioned your husband a couple of times now and the ability to have a village to get you to where you're at now. How important has he been in this whole equation um, in terms of supporting you? He understands the grind because he sounds like he played. So at the college level, he knows what it takes um, to do that. How big of a support and impact has he been on your coaching? Oh, it's been massive. So he's not only played at a high level um, at Santa Clara, youth national teams, everything like that, but he also coached at a high level. So he coached at Santa Clara on the men's side with MBLA. And then now he coaches with LAFC in the Academy. Um, but yeah, like special shout out to my husband because he has been like the biggest support system I could have imagined. Um, you may or may not know this, but we got married the same week I got the job at UCLA. So it was like a very stressful time. Wow. <laughs> and so we just got like, our life just got turned upside down. And he was so steadfast. He was so just like kind of the calm, the calm person that I needed. Um, We jokingly call him emotional support husband for this last year because he just like any kind of whatever I needed in that moment, whether it was like someone who was calm, whether it was someone who was just like back to reality, whether it was someone that was like, all right, you're too stressed. We need to do something different. Like he really made such a huge difference in my life over this last year and even prior to that too. Um, so yeah, special shout out to Michael Bates. He's the gold standard and he, yeah, he has helped me so much in this last year because there were times that I was just like swirling around, not really knowing what I was doing. And he just helped me like refocus. And also he gave me a lot of confidence in what we were doing, which allowed me to kind of just take, take the program where, where I wanted it to go in a fairly quick manner. (laughs) So you go into the interview process and one you're surprised you get the call in what's that whole process like like is it super nervous are you excited about the opportunity how do you prepare for that not one being a head coach before I would excuse me I was definitely excited but I was also slightly unprepared because I didn't 
really think it was a possibility. Also, because of our wedding that same week, the timeline was extremely condensed. So between my first call and me stepping on campus, I think was 24 hours because we were getting married in five days and there, I just had to get on campus as soon as possible. So there wasn't a ton of quote unquote preparation. I was also very lucky in that I didn't feel the need to leave Stanford. So I kind of had nothing to lose. Like I was able to go into the interview with like this attitude of like, this is who I am. This is what I think. This is my vision for the program. But I didn't have to like, sorry, I don't know. If that's um, I didn't have to like put on a front or put on a show. Like I was like, this, this is who I am. If this is what they want, great. If not, then I'm still extremely happy. I still am in an incredible program and like another opportunity will come along. So it wasn't like an all or nothing for me, which I think just allowed me to speak very freely. It allowed me to be very honest. Like I didn't feel like I had a ton to lose, which was a nice feeling going into such a big interview. <laughs> so they come to you and say, hey, we would like you to be our head coach. How it sounds like, were you quick in saying like, yes, I want this. Uh, did you fall in love as soon as you stepped on campus? I know probably from experience, you probably played there during your college days and worked coaching at Stanford. Was that an easy decision? Um, it was because it was like, when it came to fruition, it's like, how do you say no to this? Like, and I think the biggest part that stood out to me was like, they're taking a chance on me. They're taking a chance on a first time head coach. And like, I was just overwhelmed with gratitude for that because I'm like, they could have had a lot of sitting head coaches. They probably could have had a lot of coaches that have proven themselves on a national stage and they decided to go with me. I also just in my mind, I never thought my first head coaching job would be at a program like UCLA. So I think that was the part that I knew, like, you can't turn this down. Like you're getting such a great opportunity to coach somewhere that in its first year has national championship potential. Like that just doesn't happen very often. And so I think that's the part that I was like, deep down, I knew like, this is, this is the job. I can't say no to this. What was it like stepping in? Do you talk about UCLA as a program and, you know, the John Woodens and like Mick Cronin's there now and Corey Close, like just amazing coaches throughout um, and the expectations of being a successful program. Was there some intimidation coming in or were you like, let's rock and roll. We're going to do this. Um, I don't, I don't think there was a lot of intimidation. There's expectation, like, but I feel like that's different. There's just the expectation that UCLA like should be national contenders, especially women's soccer. But the thing is like, I knew that going in and I knew that in my interview process, like that was something we talked about very openly, very freely. Um, and for some reason, like people have asked me that a lot, like, were you nervous? And I wasn't nervous, but it was just like, there was a great sense of responsibility. Like, okay, now we're here. Like my job here is to like, make sure we can compete for championships. But I didn't ever feel like the nerves. And I think part of that is because it was realistic. I think I would have felt very nervous if they were telling me this. And I knew deep down that the team was nowhere close to that. Then I would feel like apprehensive. Like, how am I going to do that? But I think deep down, I knew that like this team has so much potential. Like we are, we should be considered one of the best teams in the country. So it only feels natural that there is such high expectation. Um, I will say though, in regard to just the great coaches that are at UCLA, like the greater coaching community in Westwood has been so like outwardly supportive to me from day one. And so that also, I think, calmed some of the nerves. Even when I first accepted the job, our AD, Martin Jarman, he said to me, like, he's like we know you're a first time head coach. Like, and we know that this is hard, but like, you're not alone. Like if anything comes up, call me. If anything is up, calls or call your sports administrator. Like there's a whole network of coaches that want to help. And so that I think also really helped to just calm down the situation and make me feel like, all right, I can do this. So you go on honeymoon, awesome time and all that. When you get back, do you hit the ground running? Like, is it go time? Um, you know, you've got players clearly that you said we're capable of doing some really good things. Do you start, you have to recruit? Um, what does your, what did your spring look like as you transitioned into the head coaching role? 
yeah, it was wild. Um, so we actually, I actually accepted the job on our honeymoon. So our honeymoon was like fun for one or two days. And then once I accepted the job, it was very stressful. I kind of felt like, all right, we need to get back to California. Like I need to start getting to work. Um, and we needed to move and pack and all of these things in our first like three days of marriage. So it was kind of crazy. Um, but the spring, like the first couple weeks was all about just establishing relationships with the players. Like we met with every single one of them kind of just talked about what has your experience been here? What has it, what is it like? What do you want it to be? What's missing? Um, what do you think we can do? I kind of gave them an open forum. Like if you guys have questions about me, like now so it's time to ask, like I'm an open book. Like I don't have anything to hide, like go ahead and ask. Um, and then when we started our on-field sessions, that's when the reality did kind of hit me where I was like, oh boy, we've got a lot of work to do. Um, and so those first couple of weeks was like very much a diagnostic of, all right, this, these are our strengths. These are our weaknesses. This is how we can play. I'm not a coach. Like, I love a certain style of football. Like, don't get me wrong, but I'm also like, we need to win games. So if I want to play a certain way, we don't have the players to do it. Then, then we're not going to play that way necessarily. So that first month was all about analyzing that and really kind of deciding what are we going to look like in the fall and how do we tailor the next six months of training to, to get there. Um, but yeah, it was, the spring went by so quick. I'm actually very much looking forward to this winter and spring where like our whole staff is here. I'm not trying to figure things all out for the first time. And I feel like we can get a lot more out of these next six months than we did a year ago. I think the one that's kind of thing that's refreshing is the fact that this is a high level group and you already recognize like we've got some strengths, but we clearly had some weaknesses. You mentioned earlier spending a lot of time on defending. How yeah. important was those eight months of preparation in the defensive side for you all when it went came into the season? So to put in perspective, our first 11 to the 11 game that I that we did in January when I first took over. There were more goals scored in that game alone than our entire fall season this year against us. Whoa. So the game we played 11 v 11, my first couple of weeks, it was like a 45 to 60 minute game. And the score was seven to six. And I said, Oh my gosh, we need to work on defending. And then, yeah, this season, I think we gave up 12 goals total. So I feel like we really made a lot of progress um, because yeah, it was mostly the defensive side. Like they just didn't, our team as a whole didn't really value defending. Like they would be totally fine winning a game five to three. Whereas in my hold mind. On. Will you hold on one second? I got a freaking rabbit in here going nuts. Oh yeah, do your thing. Come here, you stupid thing. Jeez, oh, Pete. Oh, the joys. Oh, yeah. All right. Um, so you're talking about defending, scoring. All right. Um, how important – you're talking about the defending and going into the season. I know that your keeper ended up being a fifth-year keeper. How important was having her in, the, in between the, the posts for you when it came to developing your defensive idea? Yeah, so she'll probably hate me for this, but she actually is a sixth year keeper. So like even older. Super, um, super senior. Yeah, yeah. Um, and she was huge for us, just her presence alone. I think like in asking our players to defend in a different way, um, just having her back there gave them that security to do it. Like they didn't feel like, okay, if we make a mistake in this brand new system of defending, then we're going to get scored on. Like, I think they knew, okay, they have a bit of a fail safe back there where it's like, all right, if we make the mistake, we at least have someone there that could potentially save almost anything, which I think was huge for our group. And then credit to Lauren, like, I think all of our senior players to have a, like a brand new staff in your last year, like they had to make a choice kind of how they were going to approach that. And they could have chosen to just kind of go through the motions, get through the last three months of their career, whatever. Or they did, or what they ended up doing was completely the opposite, which was like, all right, we're going to really lead the charge in like accepting this new staff and accepting all these changes. And they were just so impactful in the most positive way, like in regard to our team and team's culture and 
kind of the direction that we were trying to take the group. So I have like, I'll never forget that class. I won't ever forget, obviously, this whole team being my first year and, and the successes we enjoyed. But like that senior class and the senior leadership that we had this year was was one of the biggest differences, I think, kind of especially in taking over a program. In terms of getting it all together, you also, not just the seniors, but you had your incoming freshmen. How do you get all of them to kind of buy in on this first one? Because your freshmen were thinking, hey, we're going to be with her for three, four years. So we're building something. Whereas the seniors are like, no, we're, we need to get it done now. Yeah. Um, again, I, I give credit to the senior leadership. I think they were like, the quicker that everyone could adjust, the quicker everyone could buy in, the better. Um, the freshmen kind of laugh because obviously there are a lot of changes, I think, from previous staff and program to what it is now. And it's funny when you have like three quarters of a team that's had one experience and then you have a new freshman class that knows no different. Um, but I think the freshmen were fantastic in that they very much followed the lead of everybody else while still bringing kind of what they add to the program, both off and on and off the field. Um, but it was kind of not difficult, but um, it was something we had to be very thoughtful about in terms of how to manage the group and how to manage kind of everyone's different experiences in the program or for the freshmen, like the fact that they had no experience in the program and they were just like kind of looking around for guidance. Um, but the seniors really like, I think, stepped up in a really incredible way. And they're like, no, this is what we're doing. Like, and this is how we're acting. This is how we're going about things. And, um, you know, in a lot of ways, like the the upperclassmen really had our backs as a staff and vice versa. But I know there was a lot of talks kind of behind the scenes in the locker room that that helped us build that trust a lot quicker. Was there a moment or like a game or a, a something that happened during the season where you thought, hey, we've got a really legit way, reason to think that we could actually win all of this? I know there's expectations and and what have you, but how did, was there a point where you thought, you know what, I think we can actually make this happen, not just talk about it, not just say we're good enough, but was there a time where you said, yep, I think we can do this? It's, yeah, it's kind of funny. I'm on our staff. I'm definitely the most, like the biggest realist. Cause I don't think I had that moment until we went to the final four. Hmm. Because in my mind, like, I know, like we were ranked number one for eight or nine weeks, I think. But in my mind, I'm like, unless you get to the final four, you really have zero chance of winning. So <laughs> like, yeah, there were times through the season where I was like, all right, yeah, we're one of the better teams or yeah, we can be dangerous. Um, I think when you go back to the weekend, we played Duke and UNC. What was most encouraging from that is both games. We got out possessed both games. We got out shot, but we won, we won both games. And I think for me that said like, all right, this team has championship potential because even in games where perhaps we're outplayed, we can win. And in the playoffs, you need that. Like, you're not always going to be the better team. You're not always going to have the most chances, whatever it is. Like, you hope that you dominate, but that's not always the case. So I always knew, like, our team is a contender because we don't, which is totally against everything I thought about soccer before this year. It was like, we don't need the ball to be dangerous. So that gives us so much flexibility in how we're going to approach a game. Like if you're a team that is only dangerous in possession, well, then that means in every game, you need to prioritize possession. We were able to be dangerous in possession and also out of possession. So I'm like, okay, tactically, that now opens the door for both sides. We can concede possession and still win games. So that gave me like, all right, just that confidence, like we can be very versatile. But like I said, like you can't win really until you make it to the final four. That's like when it feels real. Like, and I really feel like once you get to the final four, anything can happen in those two games. Um, and so that's when I got a little excited. But prior to that, I was like, none of this matters unless we actually make it there. You talked about the defensive side almost being as important as being in possession. How how do you communicate that with the players and get them to buy in? Because players want the ball at their feet. We want to go score goals. Clearly in your preseason game way back in January, that's what they love to do and maybe not so much on the defensive side, how do you get them to be like, hey, it's fine if they have the ball. That's part of our plan. We're really good defensively. It's going to work to our favor. It's part of it is just perspective. And the way we do that is like through a lot of team talks and just tactical discussion. But like the World Cup, 
was a great teacher for us this year. High level games were great teachers because we're like, all right, go watch, go watch Man City play Liverpool. Like, go look at how each team is approaching the game. Like, go, you know, when we go into the World Cup, like, go watch Morocco. Like, they didn't have possession for a lot of games, and yet here they are in the semifinal. Like, helping our players kind of see soccer as more of a chess match than just like kind of doing whatever you want in the game has been huge for us. Like giving them that tactical understanding and more so a tactical appreciation, I think, where it's like, no, the goal of this game is to win. The objective is to win. Like that doesn't always mean you have to have the ball. The best example was the Duke UNC game. Like we knew as a staff going into UNC because we played, we had played Duke two days prior. It was like our fifth or sixth game of the season. We didn't have the legs to try to outrun and outpossess both teams. So we knew long before the season had started that probably against UNC, we were going to have to sit back and counter. But getting our players to buy into that was hard because especially UCLA, that's not what they've ever done before. And so we did a lot of like, just very transparent. Like, this is why we're doing it. It's not permanent. Like, this isn't how we're going to play every single game. But this is what we think is going to be the best formula to win. And we basically asked, do you guys want to win or not? <laughs> like, do you want to win? Like, let's do this. And, and, and it was also giving them the confidence, like, telling them, like, look at the players we have up top. Like, every team in the country has to respect our counterattack just because of who we have. And if they don't, like, they're, they'll, be, they'll get punished for it because – like who wants to defend Raylan Turner in 45 yards of space? Not many, you know, same thing with Lexi, right? Like who wants, and then against those game, or in those games, we played a two front with Lexi and Ray up top. I'm like, you guys, we would ask our back line, would you want to defend Lexi and Ray in an entire half of space? And they say, no, I said, great. Well, that's what we're going to ask UNC to do. So here we go. Like, but I think once we explain the tactics, and the reasoning behind doing these things, then our team was able to see like why it was going to set us up for success. And as soon as we kind of got them to switch their brain from thinking of it as like, I'm a player, I want the ball to, okay, I'm a coach and this makes sense. Then all of a sudden everybody was on board. One of the things that I kept hearing announcers talk about during games, as you're making your run to the college cup, was your ability to seem calm on the sidelines, like literally sitting, even during the the final four, you were just kind of chilling over there, which I know you weren't chilling. You were constantly thinking and what have you, but what, what, why sit? What does that do? Is it big, give build confidence? Is that just something you feel like, Hey, we've done everything in terms of these discussions you were just sharing um, in practice um, or, you know, what is your coaching style, I guess, in a way? So part of it is practicality and part of it is just my personality. I think from a practical standpoint, I'm like, we're playing in front of 10,000 fans. I don't know what people expect me to scream from the sideline. That is actually going to make a big difference. <laughs> like, like they cannot hear me at all. So there's part of it is that um, the other side is just personality wise. Like I tend to be pretty calm and pretty task oriented. So while the game's going on, I see my job as a coach to be like, to analyze, observe, and then find solutions. So even when like we're getting pounded or we're like under pressure, I'm looking for a change to make either tactically or through personnel that's going to solve the problem. Oftentimes solving it is not just like screaming at your player. That's not going to solve it usually for a long period of time. Like that might solve it for that moment. But the problem will still exist unless I make a tactical change. So I see my job as to be making those changes. And for me, and this is just how I think, the only way I can do that is like in a calm state of mind. <laughs> so I stay calm so that I can, in many ways, like help the team the most. If I'm just screaming at everything, like and then I'm not thinking very much personally. Some people may be able to do that. I can't. So usually when I'm watching, that's my thought process. Now like against Alabama. The other thing also was like, I like to look at the game from a more global sense. We had two or three great chances in the first 10 minutes. So then in my mind, like 
that allowed me to be pretty calm. Even when the score is zero, zero, I'm like, all right, but we're creating chances and we're creating chances in the way that we thought we were going to. So I had confidence that our game plan was working and it was going to work. So I didn't have to be super frantic and trying to figure out something else. On the flip side, UNC, when we're down to zero, I probably look the same, but I was feeling very differently trying to find that solution. Like, okay, we need to actually make some changes in order to be successful. But I think I'm just lucky that my face always looks calm. <laughs> Even when it's not, it looks calm. <laughs> was there a point that um, you were able to actually enjoy the experience? Because a lot of people I hear when you go through it, like an amazing run like you have just experienced, sometimes you get so caught up in it that you don't really get to experience the moment. Did you feel like you got to, or have you had time now that you've had this, you're in the dead period to kind of look back and go, holy moly, what did I just do? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would say throughout the regular season, I didn't have too many moments of enjoyment because I think I knew that like the real season starts in playoffs. So like everything up to that, I wasn't really enjoying that much. Like when we had a long win streak and we had, number one ranking or whatever like that really meant nothing to me I was like yeah none of that matters until we're in playoffs once we got to the final four though I think that's when I start to enjoy it because like I said earlier like that's when you know you actually have a chance to win like now the fun part is like we told our team like because you know they call it like the big dance like playoffs I'm like okay you were at winter formal now we're going to pro like it's different like the final four is the actual dance because now it's like anything can happen. The other thing is like, I, I actually think I enjoyed it a lot. Like part of that is because I was first year head coach and really how much pressure was I playing with? Not that much. Like we made it to the final four. That was still a lot to be proud of. And I think the changes we made within our group were also a lot to be proud of. So even our team, I think was playing with smaller amounts of pressure maybe than other teams I've coached. Um, and we actually preached it a lot about enjoying it. Like the pregame speech, quote unquote, that I gave prior to the final was like, like lead with gratitude. Like if you're nervous, like just look around and be thankful for this. Like how many people in their entire career get to play in this game before the final? And like you guys have done so much. And as a staff, we're thankful for you guys for helping us get here. And you should be thankful for all your teammates that like, the time and effort energy that they put in. And like one of the things that made our team special this year was how much they enjoyed the season and how much they enjoyed moments. Sometimes for me, almost too much. I was like, oh gosh, we are going into the final and our team is like dancing, dancing. Like <laughs> we don't look very serious, you know? Um, but that was something that we really cherished throughout the year. So yeah, I actually say, especially the final four and five, I really enjoyed it. Was it stressful? Yes, but it was so cool. Like. How many people get to coach in that? So few. At the very beginning, you talked about New Jersey and your parents moving out to California and kind of just propelling this whole journey. How excited were they at the Final Four with you? Like, How excited have they been to see you, one, have success at Santa Clara and then coach at Stanford and do all the great things with the young ladies moving, you know, that are playing now in college to now seeing you as a head coach at, What's it been like for them and for you and their the whole dynamic? So it's kind of funny. Um, my dad didn't make the trip. One, he's scared of flying, so it's a long flight for him. But then two, the games are too stressful for him. He doesn't like to watch. And I think now he used to watch my Stanford game. So I think now that I'm the head coach, he feels it's like even more pressure. So he doesn't really like to watch it. He'll like watch, check into the stats and then, the rest of my family or friends like they'll text him and stuff but he doesn't watch too many games live I do believe he watched the semi and the final on tv but that's kind of rare my mom and then my stepdad they made the trip out and it was really special to just like share that moment with them and uh, my mom I think actually hated watching me play because I was like I was kind of reckless like I go into tackles I probably shouldn't go into and like very self-sacrificial like if I broke my leg or something I'd be like yeah but I won the ball like so I don't think she really enjoyed watching me play too much I think she much more enjoys watching me coach it's safer you know <laughs> so I think she was in tears like just loving it um very proud very just like 
excited to be there. My husband was there leading the cheers. He's in some of the videos you'll see in them having just a blast. So I felt very, very fortunate to have like my close friends and family there kind of to see a somewhat historic moment, I guess. As we, as you transition from that amazing season and here you are in the dead period, kind of like finally getting to relax with family and all that. What does, do you say, Hey, we've got to do it again. Do we, you talk about being the realistic one, like, Hey, it's going to be a grind again. We start and we rock and roll. I mean, what are the expectations moving forward? Do you say hey, that was last year's group? We have to create our new dynamic and figure out what's our strengths and weaknesses. Like, what does the next Bruins group look like for you moving forward? Yeah, I think obviously the expectation or the hope or both is to win again. Um, I know how hard it is to win back, back, back to back. Like, that is really tough. Um, I think as a staff, our job now is to very realistically, very pragmatically look at the group and say, okay, like one, how, what are we going to do to motivate this team? You know, how are we going to draw on the experiences we had and yet make the changes necessary for continued success? Um, how are we going to replace, not replace, but, um, some of the pieces that we lose and not just what they provided on the field, but also some of the leadership that I talked about with that senior group, the leadership they provided off the field. So kind of like cultivating those things, cultivating the um, solutions, I guess, to like the needs that we identify is going to be huge. Um, I don't think the team's going to lack for motivation because I, even as soon as we won it, like obviously they were excited, they were loving life. But a couple of days later, we, I saw some of the younger players on campus and they were like buzzing. They're like, like, this is what we did after just 10 months together. Like, like, let's see what we can do after a year or two. Um, like our entire back line, aside from Maddie, who's a graduating senior, they're all sophomores. So they're looking at it like, especially from the defensive side, they're like, now imagine how much more comfortable we're going to feel next year. Like now that we've done it. So I think that piece is really exciting. And the team is like, they're ready to go again, which is awesome. Like, I think they, they know that we um, not overcompensated, but a lot of our success came from just like defensive discipline. And then a lot of just belief, like, I mean, obviously the final, like you don't do that and come back from down to zero without just like belief. But I think they're excited too. like, okay, how much better can we get on the field? And just like the nuances both defensively and offensively, I think that's the part. Like, and we've told them this year, one of my biggest challenges as a first, not first time head coach, but first year with the program is we were doing so much teaching because everything that we presented, we were teaching the entire team for the first time, for the most part. And that um, our sessions were not super efficient because we did a lot more explaining than you typically would do with a team that's done that exercise two or three times or conceptually understands on a basic level, what we're asking them to do. So we did so much teaching at times. We felt like, okay, as information overload, we actually had to withhold some things because we just couldn't implement them. And so now we're excited as a staff where it's like, all right, now they have the basic knowledge. So now we can teach the more complex ideas or just like those small nuances um, that hopefully will, you know, continue to breed more success on the field. So that's the program. What about you as a coach? Are there certain things that you have in mind moving forward or are you just kind of in the moment I want to continue to grow UCLA and then if something comes about um, do you have any aspirations maybe to go maybe professional or go bigger or are you just kind of like I said just kind of in the moment and enjoying where you're at now I'm in the moment um, I one of my goals I think for the program is to establish it as not just one of the best teams on the field, but also just like a destination spot um, in terms of the overall experience. And that takes time. Like that's not just a one-year project. So um, that's the part that I'm really looking forward to right now. After that, you know, like, I don't know. I feel like I've gotten so fortunate. I'm here at UCLA without a ton of planning or purpose. So I'm kind of going that way again, where it's like, you know what, I'm going to enjoy my time at UCLA. I'm going to try to do it to the best of my ability. And then, you know, we'll see what doors open and whether or not I want to walk through them. Like, I think I'll be very happy at UCLA for a long time. Um, 
like me and my family, I think we really enjoy LA and the LA culture, which has been really nice and exciting. Um, and then, you know, I think people always ask me about the pro level or perhaps the national team level and something like that. And, um, you know, who knows if that's in my future or not. I think if it is, then that's an incredible opportunity. But I also feel like we have the opportunity to make UCLA something really special. And so I'm enjoying that for now. That is a perfect way to end this chat. This is Karen with Coach's Corner Chats with Marguerite Ayazesa, and I'm out. Oh. Peace. <laughs> almost. Bye. I almost did it right. <laughs>